Throughout the history of philosophy, philosophers have always been very interested in the kinds of knowledge that we can attain on the basis of our individual efforts, all by our lonesome selves. For instance, they have always been very interested in a priori knowledge and perceptual knowledge and the knowledge that we gain from deductive and inductive inference. But generally speaking, and with only very few exceptions, the philosophers of the past had relatively little to say about the knowledge that we get from testimony. By testimony, we are talking about the exchanges that we have with other people where they tell us things through speech or writing. This is highly ironic, because it's probably fair to say that most of the interesting things that we think we know are believed only because we've read about them or heard of them from other people. Much of the most valuable kinds of knowledge comes from testimony. Given that the beliefs that we gain from testimony have such a prominent place in our intellectual lives, it is thus very important as philosophers to think about the epistemology of these beliefs. In this video, we're going to ask such questions as, can we gain knowledge solely on the basis of testimony? And if we can gain such knowledge, then how do we gain it? Broadly speaking, there are three possible positions that one could take on these questions. The first position uh, that one can take is skepticism. One could be like the philosopher John Locke and be a skeptic. According to him, we never gain genuine knowledge if we just base our beliefs on testimony from others, and that's it. Locke thinks that we can get knowledge from perception and from a priori reasoning and memory and inference, but he doesn't think that we can gain knowledge from testimony. In his view, the beliefs um, that we gain from testimony are only at best highly probable, but they never constitute knowledge. Why does Locke believe this? Well, according to him, it's because the beliefs that we gain from testimony can never be certain. They can always be undermined by further contrary testimony or experience later on. And so, therefore, according to him, they cannot be knowledge. Now, is this a good argument? Well, unless you're willing to accept skeptic skepticism about other forms of knowledge, I think that this argument is a tough sell. Locke points out that it's always possible for testimony to be undermined and that testimony isn't certain. But one might ask uh, to Locke, why can't the same be said about other types of knowledge? Can't the same be said about memory or perception? Are these forms of knowledge certain as well? Can't they be undermined? And if so, then why isn't Locke also a skeptic about memory and perception? Why has he singled out testimony as failing, to, as failing to deliver knowledge, as opposed to these other ways of gathering information? There is a lesson to be learned here. If you're skeptical about testimony, but not perception, then you have to ask yourself, what makes testimony different? If you grant that we can gain knowledge through perception, then why can we not gain knowledge through testimony? Why not also grant testimonial knowledge? All right, so let's move on. If you're not going to be a skeptic about testimony, that is, if you grant that knowledge from testimony is possible, then there are two further positions that you could take. You could be either a reductionist about testimonial knowledge, or you can subscribe to what is called the direct view of testimonial knowledge. Now, in order to see what's at issue between these two positions, uh, let me just give you an example. Let me give you some new testimonial knowledge right now. I tell you, as a fact about myself, that I have visited Singapore before. That's a fact about me that you probably didn't know until now. Now, here's a question. In order for you to know this fact about me for my testimony, do you as the audience need to come up with some sort of argument or reason for why I would probably be telling the truth? Um, do you need to come up with some 
independent uh, reason or justification for why I am a believable person. In the debate between um, reductionists and the direct view, the reductionists would answer this question by saying yes, and the adherents of the direct view would answer this question by saying no. Here's what they would say. According to reductionism, when we gain knowledge through testimony, we must justify this knowledge um, from other things that we know from other sources of knowledge, like perception, memory, and inference. In other words, the reductionist claim to testimonial knowledge ultimately reduces to other types of knowledge. So for example, in order for you to know that I've been to Singapore, you must justify your acceptance of my testimony by arguing that I'm generally a reliable person. Maybe you've had past interactions with me, and in the past, whenever you've checked, you've always found that I'm telling the truth. And so you reason your way into believing that I'm generally trustworthy and that you can gain knowledge from my testimony. Or perhaps uh, you and I don't have any prior interactions. Um, you haven't had any interactions with me specifically. But over your lifetime, you found that people generally tell the truth about mundane facts about their past travels. And so you reason, based on your past experiences, that you can believe me right now. The main point is that for the reductionist, any knowledge that you gain from testimony must be backed up by knowledge that comes from your past experiences that gives you reason to think that the speaker is credible. On the other hand, the direct view of testimony will say that you don't need to justify your knowledge from testimony by basing it on other forms of knowledge. On this view, if a speaker knows something and then they assert that thing to you, then you can come to know it just by believing them. All that's required for you to gain knowledge through testimony is that the speaker knows what they're asserting. Let me uh, summarize the difference between these two views like this. The reductionist sees testimonial knowledge as being based on the individual audience member's efforts, um, their efforts as an individual thinker. For them, it is incumbent on the audience to justify the knowledge they gain from testimony by reasoning from their past experiences. They have to build their individual case for believing others on the basis of testimony. Whereas the direct view, on the other hand, they see knowledge as more of a social phenomenon. On their view, they see the audience as being a member of a community that passes knowledge around. Knowledge is passed around as part of a group effort. If I have knowledge, then I can share it with you without any additional work on your part. And likewise, if you have knowledge, then you can share it with me without any additional effort on my part to justify this knowledge. All right, so those are the main positions in the epistemology of testimony. But now that we've talked about the epistemology of testimony, there's another topic that naturally arises in, in this discussion. Once we see um, that the giving and receiving of knowledge uh, is a communal enterprise and a good enterprise that's in the advantage of uh, community members, then we have to face up to the fact that access to this communal good is not equally distributed. Some people, marginalized people, are more often excluded from the communal sharing of knowledge. This idea is captured um, in Miranda Fricker's concept of testimonial injustice. In order to understand Fricker's concept of testimonial injustice, let's define a few terms. So first of all, Fricker defines the concept of credibility. Basically, the credibility of that a hearer assigns to a speaker is the degree of credence that they give to the speaker's testimony. It has to do with how much reliability or trustworthiness that the speaker is given, 
or how much the hearer takes them to be worthy of being listened to, or whether the hearer will treat them as an expert. Fricker admits that this concept is a bit vague, but the point is, we all make these snap judgments about how credible other people are. We take some people to be more credible than others, um, especially in certain contexts and certain times and places. And sometimes this is, this is fine. Um, for example, I take my doctor to be more credible about my health than random people from the internet. And I think that's a fine thing to do. But other times, um, uh, it is wrongful and pernicious to treat other people as less credible. For example, in a misogynistic society, women are systematically afforded less credibility than men. And in a racist society, people of color are systematically afforded less credibility than white people. In a classist society, um, those who are deemed high class will be afforded more credibility than those who are deemed low class. With these concepts in place, Fricker then defines the notion of a credibility deficit. A credibility deficit is when a speaker receives less credibility than they should have. This, basically, the credibility that the speaker is given by their audience doesn't reflect the facts of how reliable and knowledgeable of a person they really are. With these concepts in place, Fricker then defines the notion of a credibility deficit. A credibility deficit is when a speaker receives less credibility than they should have. Um, the credibility that they're given by their audience does not reflect the facts of how reliable and knowledgeable of a person they really are. Finally, with these concepts, Fricker then defines the concept of a testimonial, testimonial injustice. Basically, she says that a speaker sustains a testimonial injustice if and only if she receives a credibility deficit owing to an identity prejudice of the, of the hearer. When audiences and hearers are prejudiced and then on, because of their prejudice, they give speakers less uh, credibility than they deserve, then that constitutes a injustice towards the speaker. Fricker argues that a testimonial injustice is both morally and epistemically wrong. Moreover, she argues that um, in order to understand the wrongness of testimonial injustice, you have to understand it as both moral and epistemic. It's, moral, it's a moral wrong because, according to Fricker, testimonial injustices insult the speaker in the capacity in their capacity as a knower. It's like saying to the speaker, you're not really worthy of our, of our credence, of our attention. You don't really know what you're talking about. They're also epistemically wrong because it prevents the speaker from participating in the communal exchange of knowledge, which is in their interest as a knower. It's in their interest to, uh, to participate in the community of, uh, community of um, knowing people.